Hi there! Welcome to the first YouTube cast of Brook in the Air. We'll call this a YouTube episode. Hopefully the first of many. I'm Brooke from Brook in the Air, and we're going to talk about all sorts of travel and aviation related topics, but especially one of my favorites, historical aviation, notably historical military aviation. See, when I was in grad school a couple years ago, I fell deeper in love with military history and married this love with passion or aviation. True passion. If Now, I realize that sounds a bit romantic, but history in itself is romantic to an extent. And while it's important that we don't romanticize history, it's important to be passionate about the subject that you're dedicated to. Now, granted, this limits the time frame of historiography a bit, <clears throat> Excuse me. But I hope I can instill a love of aviation in all of you, too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or, if you already have this love, I hope that I can deepen and nurture that passion beyond mere travel. Now, world travel is important. It truly is. It broadens our minds, expands and enhances our perspectives with different and varied cultures, enhances a sense of progressive thought, and it can help us appreciate what we already have. Experiencing different cultures, societies, and values, and people is vastly underrated and helps perfect perspective to our lives. But, here's a but, understanding history is critical to comprehending our own world and where we've come from and possibly where we're going to as a people and as a society. <clears throat> hmm, excuse me. As the famed Virginian Patrick Henry in 1774 said, I know of no way by which to judge the future except by the past. This is not his most famous quote, not by a long run. Um, for sure, Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death has a sure lock on the most famous Patrick Henry quotes of all time adage. But importantly, judging the future by the past does not mean uh, predicting the future. That's impossible and ridiculous by all rights and reason. Rather, judging the future by the past means utilizing contemporary historiography to evaluate where a given historical subject might cause us or any other given nation, state, or people might possibly end up in modern times or in the future, depending again on ongoing and evolving circumstances. <clears throat> now, now, before I delve too far down the rabbit hole of historiography and sociopolitics, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, I think I need something to drink. Let's instead return to the world of military aviation, and for this episode at least, legacy and history of the one and only Douglas Aircraft Company's B-18 Bolo. What? I can hear you saying? Yes, the B-18. In 1934, the U.S. Army Air Corps, the predecessor of the contemporary U.S. Air Force, put out a request for proposals for a twin-engine heavy bomber. While well, inferior to the Boeing Model 299, the immediate predecessor and prototype of the B-17 Flying Fortress, being in the midst of the Great Depression, the Model 299 having four engines, thus a far steeper price tag, it cost nearly three times as much for one Model 299 as the DB-1, as the Douglas prototype was referred to. It was a no-brainer for the War Department, the early 20th century version of the Air Force, I mean, the Department of Defense, sorry. <clears throat> to go the B-18. In 1934, the Bolo was considered the height of military technology, insofar as bombers were concerned. Now, unfortunately, by the height of major hostilities in Europe by 1940, often denoted by the start of the infamous Battle of Britain, it was poorly equipped and poorly armed for a bomber of its equivalent overseas counterpart, such as the Third Reich's Junkers Ju-88 medium bomber, which had extremely high performance by comparison, Again, for a bomber. Though it is important to remember that Junkers Aircraft and Motor Works had designed the J-88 to appear as a civilian aircraft to fully allies under stipulations of the very punitive Treaty of Versailles. I must reiterate, despite the B-18 below being designated a heavy, heavy bomber, heavy bomber, the Luftwaffe's J-88, which started production a year later than B-18 in 1935, was a medium bomber, and was comparably far superior by 1940, despite the latter's heavy losses by the end of the Battle of Britain. Over 18,000 examples of the JU-88 were built by the war's end in 1945, making JU-88 far more comparable in overall service and combat usage to the B-17. The latter was, again, much more effective. 
The B-18 was developed by Douglas Aircraft Corporation from their civilian DC-2 14-passenger mid-range airliner. It was designed to replace the aging and archaic Martin Corporation B-10 bomber, the first all-metal all -metal monoplane all-weather bomber. While the B-18 was a significant improvement over the B-10, that is really all it was. The B-18's high watermark, an otherwise all-around high point of the Bolo's operational history, was anti-submarine warfare, a task which it held throughout the Second World War, where it became the uh, first U uh, U.S. combat aircraft to sink a German U-boat, which happened to be in the Caribbean Sea at the time. The B-18's defensive armament was considered highly inadequate, consisting only of dorsal, ventral, nose-mounted, manu manually-operated 30 caliber gun turrets. For a bomber, the B-18 was painfully slow, especially when compared to its immediate contemporaries such as the Soviet Aleutian TSKB-30, or DB-3 for short, and the Imperial Japanese Army's Mitsubishi G-3M-2, the only non-militarized version, the early non-militarized version of the IGA trademark medium bomber, a light reporting named Nell, which both flew around the world or close to it, eclipsing the bullet's maximum operational range. In the case of the G3M2, the plane threw, flew from Hokkaido, Japan, to Anchorage, Alaska, at a distance of just over 2,500 miles, uh, far beyond not just the operational range, but the maximum range of the B-18. Now, granted, that plane was stripped down to its bare, uh, like, just bare skeleton, and full of gas tanks, and um, had to stop, I think, once for refueling. But still, point remains. Eventually, the U.S. Army Air Corps fully acknowledged that B-18 was outdated, outmatched, outgunned, and frankly useless in the face of advanced and technologically sophisticated enemy and allied aircraft. In the Pacific Theater, most B-18s were destroyed on the ground, while those that remained were pulled back to the continental United States. They contributed nothing noteworthy to the duration of the war. Ultimately, it was decided that, in the Pacific Theater, the B-18 Bolo would be used as a subcap measure until a more sophisticated and technologically advanced Boeing B-17 came online and then service en masse. By 1943, two years until the end of the war, the B-18 was removed from anything remotely resembling a frontline service and kept for coastal defense of the U.S. mainland. In particular, resembling... I'm sorry. In particular, submarine hunting, as mentioned, and chiefly as a bomber crew trainer for crews going into actual bombers, such as the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress heavy bomber, Martin Aircraft Corporation B-26 Marauder medium bomber, the famous consolidated B-24 Liberator heavy bomber, and eventually as the Pacific Theater escalated towards its inevitable conclusion, the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress, Super Fortress heavy bomber. In the end, B-18 Bolo was the bomber equivalent of the Brewster Aeronautical Corporation's F-28 Buffalo fighter, completely outdated and utterly useless in battle. Against more nimble, agile, and frankly advanced adversaries, the B-18 Bolo was too slow, carried too small a bomb load, and packed an inadequate defensive armament. Bomber represented an age of flight where peacetime reigned supreme and complacence with such the forefront of U.S. military strategy. Great Depression or no? We will see you next time on Brook in the Air. And don't forget, my Los Angeles trip award is coming up next month. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you in the air. Bye!